Uh, my name is Britton, and I'm lead pastor here at St. Paul's United Methodist Church. I just want to welcome you into this space, this sanctuary, this place where we seek refuge and peace from everything that we have to experience in our world. And whenever I talk to people as, before they, we come to worship, I would say, hey, I hope that this hour, with everything that you have going on in your life, I hope that this one hour can be a place where you find peace and rest. And so I hope the same for each and every one of you uh, who have walked into this space here today. So welcome. We are uh, in an important series where we've been talking about life together. We've been talking about the, the Holy Trinity, the Blessed Trinity, which is a subject that we don't always discuss in church, but how if we can reclaim what the Trinity means for, for us as, as Christians, um, it can actually reveal something about ourselves. Uh, it, can, it can reveal something about how we were made for relationship. Uh, back in, in the book of Genesis, um, it talks about we were created in God's image. And when you think of God being three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we were created in that image. We were created in the image of relationship, and so therefore we were made for relationship. Our power, our true power, comes when we come together as people. And when we come together around one common cause, we, we can do amazing things. We can conquer and solve all types of problems in our world. I've been a part of, on, on numerous occasions, at least in the small town that I grew up in, where someone had a house fire or an apartment fire. You know, they lost a lot of their belongings or even maybe their whole house, and so they had to relocate. And I've watched, I've seen this where the whole community surrounded them. Has anybody been a part of something like that? People are bringing clothes and food and furniture, all kinds of stuff. Maybe you've been on the receiving end of that. And it's like for that one little moment in that time and in that place, nothing else matters. It's just that we're together. And so you think about what we do in our world as people. When those moments fade away, those really critical moments, those crisis moments, uh, we, we tend to, uh, well, quite honestly, we, we tend to get a little more judgy. <laughs> And so we put people in categories, and we can come up with all kinds of categories. But for that moment, none of that stuff matters. All that matters is that there's a living human being in front of us, and the relationships is what's most important. Uh, in, in, in the book of Galatians, and this is so I, we don't miss the importance of, this script, uh, of, of what we're doing in this Life Together series. In the book of Galatians, uh, Galatians 3.28, it says this, says, There's no longer Jew or Greek. There's no longer slave or free. There's no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And when I think about what it means to live life together, uh, I, I look at the scripture and saying, regardless of what we are, whatever category we put ourselves in, whatever category someone else puts us in, it doesn't matter. And it's not that we don't see difference. We acknowledge the difference. We are aware of the difference. This is just who we are as people. And we come together anyway. We love the person even in their difference because the relationship is most important. You can say amen to that if you want to. I don't care. I thought that was good. That's like scripture. This is scripture. And we all have a role to play in this life together thing that we're doing. We all have an important part. You bring something, something so unique and so special to this community. And when I say this community, to the church, think about how you come in. How, how many people here today are sitting in their assigned seats at church? Yeah, I see Bill over there. Johnny's there too. And some of us float around, that's fine, but when you come and you sit in a place, and we kind of know where people sit, not all the time, but we kind of know if that person is missing, it's like a part of us is, something's missing within us, right? The, the same is true not just for the church, but for our community and our world, for your family, for your friends. If you are not there, there is a part of us that is missing. Each person contributes and brings and enhances the relationship, the community together. And that's where our power is. We see this model in the, in the Trinity, you think of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you take one of those out, and it changes the whole dynamic. It's not the same. It's just not the same. We were made for community. So 
Today we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is its one of those things that it's really hard to wrap our minds around, it, like the Trinity, but if I think of the Father and the Son, at least we have some stories that we can go to when we think of the Father and the Son. The Father, we think of the creation story, or we think of, of multiple moments uh, throughout um, our interactions with Jesus, where Jesus is inter- interacting with the Father. Uh, the Uh, Jesus, we have a whole whole historical record. We can go back and look at Jesus' life, but the Spirit is, it's a little bit different. Yet at the same time, the Spirit is the primary way that we experience God. If you've ever said, hey, I have have had a divine encounter with God, you are talking about the the Holy Spirit. Because the, the Spirit is really the way God moves among us here, and now the Spirit's with us today. The Spirit was here before you walked into this place. The Spirit will be with you wherever you go. And we see the Spirit first in the book of Genesis. Surprise, surprise. They're all there. They've all been there since the beginning, Father, Son, and Spirit. In the book of Genesis 1, uh, verses 1 through 2, so uh, right out of the gate, it says, In the beginning God created heavens and earth, and now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So you see God's Spirit there in the act of creation, uh, partnering with, with God the Father to do the work of creation. Uh, there's, a, there's a felt presence, there's a nearness associated with the Spirit. The, the Spirit was hovering over the waters, was, there was a closeness. And that word Spirit comes from the Hebrew word ruach, which is a fun word to say on a Sunday morning. And it really gets used for things like God's breath and God's wind, or the wind, just, just wind in general. We see that in, in the parting of the Red Sea story, when the Israelites are leaving Exodus, if you can recall that story. Their backs are kind of against the wall, where they're, back, they're, they're against the sea. They have nowhere to turn. There's an ar- uh, army pending down on them, and suddenly the, the sea opens up and they, they can pass through because God made a road through the sea. And here's what it says in Exodus 14, 21. It says, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land. And the waters were divided. That word wind is the word ruach. That's where we see God's Spirit showing up again. God's Spirit is helping them in their time of need. The Spirit also empowers us. We see this again in time and time again throughout the biblical narrative. I've been reading the book of Judges recently. I don't know why. I just kind of ended up there. And I, I read through a couple of the Gospels, and then I went to the book of Judges. And in the book of Judges, they talk about how God's Spirit is living within the Judges. These are leaders of the early Israelite tribes. Before they were a great nation, they were a tribal group. So they had different, different tribes all over that, that region. And these were leaders, they were judges. That, that means they could judge what God would want, maybe, in their communities. And so they had this gift, and the Spirit was upon them and within them. And sometimes it even talks about the Spirit rushing upon them, coming to them. So the Spirit uh, helps, it empowers, and we see it in, 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 God, in, in breath and in, in wind, so, which is a perfect metaphor because we can't really grasp it. We can't hold on to it, but we can feel the wind, right? We can feel it. So Jesus actually tells us a little bit about the Spirit, too. Uh, there's a moment that he has with the disciples where he's going to leave them. And as he's telling them that he will, no long, he will be departing them, of course, they're distraught. They are, they are uh, in great distress over this news. He gives them a, a bit of comfort, and he tells them about the Holy Spirit. Here's what he says. This is in John 14, verses 25 through 26. It says, I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, so there's the Father sending the Spirit, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I said to you. So that word Spirit, uh, Holy Spirit, uh, it, it gets translated in our scripture as advocate here. There are several different English translations. Has anyone heard a different word for the Holy Spirit before? 
Can you shout it out, maybe? Counselor. Counselor. Yeah, that's one. Anyone else? Have, have you heard other names for the Spirit? What was that? Comforter. Comforter. Absolutely. Others? Things like counselor, comforter, helper is one. I looked all these up, so I have all the answers, right? (laughs) It's really not a fair game. You all are doing great. (laughs) Companion, intercessor, strengthener. These are all names to try to understand who the Holy Spirit is and how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. It it actually comes from this, this Greek word called parakletos. Everyone say that, parakletos. Another fun word for you to say on a Sunday. This is a compound word. So it's two words that they've smushed together to create a new meaning. Uh, Parakletos comes from the word para, which means beside or near. And kletos, it's not cletus like your cousin cletus. That's if you want to say it with your Missouri accent. (laughs) Kletos means called or invited. So the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the counselor, is the one who comes beside or near us, calling us and inviting us into something new. Isn't that great? So because of that... I can say this, the Holy Spirit, one of the primary functions of the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit leads. The Holy Spirit leads. Calling us to the heart of God, inviting us into into a relationship with God, inviting us to think about things maybe in a new way. Telling us maybe to go to, to a place, a new place, maybe physical, emotional, spiritual. The work of the Holy Spirit is really, it's transformational. It might cause me to to pack up my bags and move from Kansas City to Joplin. It might. It might cause you to change the way that you or I, I think, that we think about other people, about our world, or even about God. I've had that, a new revelation, a new understanding, a deeper understanding of who God is. And the thing that I love about the Spirit is the Spirit doesn't just lead us by being out in front of us. I think the Spirit is out in front of us. But the Spirit is also all around us, so we don't have to do all this work of catching up. Sometimes we got to do that as the church, because sometimes we get a little behind and we're not going where the Spirit's leading But the Spirit is beside or near us, almost holding our hands, pulling us along into what we are invited to be a part of. So the Holy Spirit does that by advocating on our behalf. The Holy Spirit advocates. Now, word, advocate, if you can think about what that would mean, if someone would advocate for you, it's someone that would know you. And if they didn't know you, they would take the time to learn something about you. And they would would do things that they think would help you. Even if you had no idea if that was going to be helpful or not. Even if you could not help yourself. They would come alongside you, interceding on your behalf, doing things in your best interest. That's what an advocate does. And I love that because... You see, you know, sometimes in the church, I think we lose our way a little bit because we come to church and, look, I love a good practical message, right? Come and teach me something about, you know, just just let me know something that I can do. When I walk out of the doors, I want to know what I have to do when I leave this place. And sometimes that that, that can be really helpful, uh, but we find ourselves in this weird, like, self-help type of zone in the church. And the beauty of what the Holy Spirit is, is that the Holy Spirit offers us help even when we can't. It's actually the opposite of self-help. It's coming to God, it's surrendering to God and surrendering to the Spirit and saying, I have nothing left. I have nowhere else to turn. Could you part the seas in my life 
and make a way forward. The Holy Spirit advocates. The Holy Spirit also comes along beside us and comforts us, gives us what we need in our time of fear, doubt, anxiety, worry, pain, grief. John Wesley was the founder of Methodism, and he struggled with this thing his whole life. He was a, a pastor. He was an Anglican priest his whole life, yet he worried about whether he had, if he had salvation or not. And so he asked this question over and over again, and he had this inner angst, this inner turmoil. I don't know if you felt that in your own life, but he describes the experience that he had with the Holy Spirit. And we call it the Aldersgate experience. This was a transformational experience for him, but the Aldersgate experience because it was on Aldersgate Street in London. And here's what he says in that moment. He says, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ and Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given to me that he, God, had taken away my sins, even mine. So you can see the unsuredness in his response. Even mine. And saved me from the law of sin and death. And the reality is, is that John Wesley already had salvation. But in this moment, the Spirit came to him and gave him that assurance, that peace, that he could rest and believe it. So I ask myself these questions all the time. Am I following where the Holy Spirit is leading? Am I following and doing the things that the, uh, to fulfill this calling, this, this mission of God for my life? Um, I have experienced the Holy Spirit before, and I was very skeptical of this at first because I thought it was my emotional state manipulating me. You know, I'm just very skeptical by nature. I'm an engineer. Can't help it. But there were multiple moments in my life, be it through an important moment of prayer or uh, through the loss of a family member. I, I had multiple uh, funerals for my grandparents. And in those times and places, I had, I, it was not a warmth. It was almost like a coldness. I know that sounds crazy. And like a tingling that came over me. And I have come to know, based on the timing and, and when they've happened, I was like, that is, that is the Holy Spirit coming upon me and bringing me peace and comfort. It's God's presence in my moment of need. So I want to take all of this so far, the, the Holy Spirit is a leader and the advocate, and I want to put it, put it together for this final statement. I want to say the Holy Spirit um, does this one final thing, the Holy Spirit disrupts. And this is the one we have the hardest time with. Because I like things neat and orderly and planned out. Anyone else like that? Okay, I see y'all. But it makes sense, right, that the Holy Spirit would disrupt because if the Holy Spirit is leading, that means we have to go where the Holy Spirit is going. And that might require a change of plan. So it, it's a, it can be viewed as a disruption to our lives. The Holy Spirit doesn't just lead me and you, but the Holy Spirit leads all of us together as a church body. That's even more challenging. Then you think about the Holy Spirit who advocates. The Holy Spirit comes along beside you and wants what is best for you in your life, but the Holy Spirit also wants that for your neighbor. So because of that, we have to be open to where the, the, the way the Spirit might be having us to learn something new or to advocate on someone else's behalf. That's just the way this kind of works. So the Holy Spirit will disrupt our lives there are certain critical moments that I have, I have seen that will pop up from time to time. I notice it most with my kids where they are they're just off for the day. So I've got three kids, and my wife is really great about this. We just know that there's something wrong and they're off. And you have to decide, hey, am I going to stop what I'm doing and come along beside them, come near them to give them the attention and the presence that they need? And this happens in almost any of our relationships. It is uh, our kids, it can be our marriage, it can be our working relationships, it doesn't matter. There are 
multiple times and places where people are screaming for help. For someone just to come along beside them. To see them and value them and listen. Offer that comforting, peaceful presence to advocate on their behalf. When the church does this at, at our best, right, the church is a part of this work too. Uh, the, in the Methodist church, in the United Methodist church, we have kind of a, a checkered history at times. Sometimes we get it right, sometimes we really mess it up. But at our best, I mean, we, were, we have leaders who are part of the civil rights movement who advocated for the right to vote and to desegregate the United States of America. That is hard work. But it's amazing work when we get it right. Advocating for God's justice for those who are, have been marginalized and oppressed. The Holy Spirit disrupts. And so what can we do when we feel that disruption? Well, I think first off, we have to pay attention to it. We have to be aware of it. Maybe we can reframe it in our mind that it's not really a disruption at, at, at all. It's actually an opportunity to, to partner with the Spirit. Uh, this past week, I had a meeting that I was a part of. It was an important meeting. One of the things that I do is I interview other pastors to, to help them decide, do they want to become another pastor? Or do they want to become a pastor? So I will sit in on meetings, and I'm part of an interview team. And I was on the other side of this for years. People were drilling me and interviewing me, and now it's flipped. It's kind of fun, actually. But I am very nice. I assure you, I am very nice in those meetings. And it's really great to hear stories from people, how they came to ministry. You hear the most interesting things that you'll ever hear. But while we were having those interviews this week, there was a man, there, there, it's at the district office here in uh, Joplin, which is over off of um, 20th Street, kind of near the library. Well, it's by um, where they're building the new Casa House, right? And uh, Rafa is going to be over there too now, I think. So anyway, it's over there, and we have people from kind of around in our, our southwest region. We're interviewing them, and a man comes to that office, and he just needs some help. He's not from here, but he's trying to get back home to his hometown in Oklahoma. And the DS comes to me and said, hey, this guy's here. Can you help him? So all of a sudden, I'm thrust into this tension. I have these responsibilities that I need to be a part of. I've made a commitment to my team, or do I just drop that and help this individual. And there's always that moment in your mind, and I will be very vulnerable with you, where you're like, do I actually have time to deal with this right now? Which is not a very healthy way to say it, because this is not a person. Anyway, so I, des I decide, okay, I'm going to help this guy. I'm going to get him what he needs. So I, I engage this individual. We talk. I end up talking on the phone with one of his family members who is from multiple states away who's trying to get him help. And I really don't do much, but I drive him around and get him to the places that he needs to go and get him the services that he, he, he needs to try to get back home. And it probably takes about an hour and a half of my time. And whenever I was done, I told him some of the stuff I'm actually telling you here in the sermon. I said, hey, I want you to know. And he had, he had so much going on in his life, all kinds of trauma and just, just a lot of stuff. There was too much work to do in a little hour and a half meeting, right? You, there's no way you're going to fix all that. I was just like, let me just help him get home. That's my single-minded focus. And I told him a lot of the things that I told you. I said, you matter. Your place here matters. You have an imprint that you can make on someone's life that I cannot. You belong in this world. So I told him all of those things. And then I ended it by saying, I hope your day gets better after this. And he looked at me straight in the eyes and he said, it already has Let's go to God in prayer. Holy God, we are so blessed to be in your presence here today. We are blessed to be known and loved by you. Uh, we, we are grateful for your spirit who comes along beside us. Even when, when we don't follow, you still come back to us. And so we give you our thanks and praise for that. God, would you continue uh, to un unleash, pour out your spirit upon us, and may we have the courage, the audacity to follow and chase after you. God, we love you and praise you, and we ask all of these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all those here say, 
Amen.